Hey, it's me, Sam B. Turns out that Republican ideas are largely unpopular with Americans, like Ted Cruz in high school. That's why the GOP has turned to gerrymandering and voter suppression to ensure that they keep winning elections. Here are our best pieces on those dirty tactics and what we can do to stop them. This week, everybody's talking about the convention, specifically who's plotting to steal them and how to stop it. This is Republican strategist Roger Stone, who you might recognize from nothing because he's been blacklisted from television after a series of racist and sexist tweets. Bet you can't guess who he supports. <laughs> Surprise! Stone's got a plan for locking in Republican delegates who might be turning toward Cruz. Come to Cleveland. We will disclose the hotels and the room numbers of those delegates who are directly involved in the steal. We urge you to visit their hotel and find them. And then what? Drink the mini bar? Charge a porno to the room? You wouldn't be advocating anything untoward. We do not advocate violence. We're not talking about roughing anybody up. We're just we talking are to people. Talking about is being a presence to let people feel the pressure of the American people. And if that feels like the pressure of a lunatic's boot on their neck and an illegally purchased handgun against their temple, hey, that's just democracy. You know, conservatives often accuse me of being biased, but I promise the second a liberal tries to threaten delegates, I'll say something about it. And that would be now. <laughs> The superdelegate hit list is not affiliated with the Sanders campaign. It's the work of self-righteous Twitter douche Spencer Thayer with an anarchy symbol, seen here shouting at a homeless man who is reading the Bible on the street. I am tired of your hypocrisy, sir. I am tired of the hypocrisy coming out of these books. Oh, it's the rare person whose two biggest pet peeves are homeless people and superdelegates. <laughs> The Roger Stone of the left also insists he's doxing delegates just so people can talk to them, which he emphasized by taking the hit out of hit list and changing the arrows piercing this deer cow hybrid's head into telephones <laughs> piercing its head. See? <laughs> Fixed it. But this raises a good question. What are Bernie or Bust Bros gonna do when they knock up their girlfriends but can't get an abortion because they decided electing President Cruz was worth it just to make a point? And also, this question. What the hell are superdelegates? Why do they exist? And will flaming bags of poop on their doorstep really convince them my candidate is better for the country? Glad to be back and oh dang, things have gotten ugly since we left. I am so sick of the Sanders campaign lying about me. I'm sick of her. I don't think you are qualified if you have voted for the disastrous war in Iraq. I think Nana and Zadie are getting a divorce. <laughs> But that is a love fest compared to how some of their supporters are behaving. This week, a Sanders fan created the Superdelegate Hit List, a website to compile the contact information of superdelegates. I'm getting calls on my personal cell phone from people all over the country. They said, um, you know, you should go to hell. How dare you vote against your own interest as an African-American woman? Hey, cool the harassment. These aren't female gamers. They're actual people. Look. Do you even know what superdelegates are? I didn't. That's why we had to go away for two weeks. <laughs> I'll try to compress it to two minutes. First of all, political parties aren't the government. They're semi-private clubs. If they wanted, they could use a sorting hat to pick their nominees. <laughs> yeah, Slytherin! <laughs> In the 1800s, party officials would just gather in a snuff bar and nominate the guy with the best facial hair, which, admit it, Brooklyn for Bernie, you could get behind. Primaries didn't exist until the invention of the automobile, because where would you have put your bumper stickers before that? And party elites still controlled the nomination until 1968, when primary voters cast their ballots for anti-Vietnam War candidates, and the Democratic Party said, mm, thank you so much, we've decided to go in another direction. <laughs> Longtime Full Frontal viewers may remember that night. Dig it, beautiful people. I'm Sammy B, live in Chicago, where my husband's letting me report from the Democratic National Convention. What a gas! 
Man, I got a heavy trip to lay on the two-thirds of Democrats who voted for anti-war candidates. The nom just went to Hubert Humphrey, the establishment cat who didn't run in a single primary and got all his delegates from party bigwigs. Far out! What did that chick say? <gasps> Humphrey's the nominee? What? Oh my god. You are oh, no, the Yeah. I believe that was the summer I had a fling with that hunky musician. I wonder whatever happened to him. To avoid another riot, the Democratic Party changed their rules to give power to the people, which the people celebrated by dropping a shit ton of acid with Hunter S. Thompson and nominating George McGovern, who went on to a resounding general election victory in D.C. and Massachusetts. <laughs> Four years later, they picked saintly, ahead of his time, Jimmy Carter, who only won because his opponent, Gerald Ford, was the Harley Quinn to Nixon's Joker. <laughs> and four years after that, Ted Kennedy waged a brutal primary challenge that left Carter as weak and defenseless as a woman left to drown in an Oldsmobile. <laughs> Sorry, guys, Ted Kennedy did a bad thing. <laughs> the Democratic Party had OD'd on democracy. Oh God, even their overdoses are boring. So in 1982, the grown-ups said, enough. From now on, Democratic governors, members of Congress, and party movers and shakers get a say in the process. And we shall call you ex officio delegates. That way, everyone who speaks Latin will know how you got this job. Normal people will call you superdelegates and have no idea. These people are like political wizards. They have the power to support any candidate they want. Like the great and powerful Oz, these superdelegates are pulling the levers of power in your political party. You do realize the whole point was that Oz wasn't powerful, right? <laughs> Oz is just a Midwestern snake oil salesman displaced to a fantasy land full of cowards, heartless people, and straw men. Sound familiar? <laughs> Superdelegates' only job is to act in the best interest of the party. That's why they have never tried to override the will of the voters. Not because they care about us, they don't, but because pissing off the voters is bad for their party, remember? <laughs> if Bernie gets more votes than Hillary, her superdelegates will drop her faster than she drops her fake Southern accent the second she leaves South Carolina. <laughs> How do I know? Because they did it in 08. So if they're not going to subvert the will of the people, what's the point of superdelegates? Think of them as the driving instructor with her foot hovering over the brake. <laughs> She'll only use her power if the party is about to do a Thelma and Louise, like if, hypothetically, John Edwards had been in the lead when this turd dropped on the eve of the 08 convention. John Edwards admitted today that he had an extramarital affair while his wife was battling cancer. Oh, he is gross. Point is, when Democratic voters have cause to regret their choice, superdelegates can help them fix it. They aren't there to protect Democrats from someone like this. They're there to protect them from someone like this. Believe me, Republicans would give their left nut for superdelegates right now. <laughs> So Democrats, when some jackass goads you into drunk dialing a superdelegate in the middle of the night, instead of saying, hey bitch, switch your vote, say, hey bitch, thank you. who actually like Republican ideas are dwindling. To stay in power, the GOP is using techniques like gerrymandering, blocking judicial appointments, and voter suppression, otherwise known as Mitch McConnell's version of the Devil's Triangle. And this week, they have outdone themselves. As the midterm elections rapidly approach, there's been a rash of voter identification conflicts in states across the country. The Republican majority Supreme Court just refused to block a voter ID law in North Dakota. But in Arkansas, the Supreme Court upheld a measure requiring voters to show photo ID. In Ohio, a federal judge ruled against voters who were purged from the rolls by the Republican Secretary of State. Georgia is at the center of a voter suppression controversy. The vote hasn't been this suppressed since Blake Shelton won Sexiest Man Alive. I mean, you <laughs> know they only counted his vote. But this election cycle, Republicans aren't even pretending anymore. A Supreme Court decision this week to allow the implementation of a voter ID law in North Dakota has some worried the Native American community won't be able to vote. The law requires voters to provide a form of identification that includes their legal name, current street address, and date of birth. For 
For some who live on reservations or in rural areas, they often use a P.O. box. The voter ID law was passed after Senator Heidi Heitkamp became North Dakota's only Democratic statewide office holder in 2012. What a wacky kalinky dink. It's just like the time Susie Henderson beat me for top Girl Scout cookie sales girl, and then a year later, when it was cookie selling time again, I ate her family. <laughs> Who could have guessed that would slow her down? In 2012, Heitkamp won her race by around 3,000 votes, and her victory was widely credited to Native American voters. This new law affects 5,000 Native American voters with almost surgical precision, taking advantage of the fact that many residents of reservations don't have individual street addresses. In order to get an address, they would have to call their 911 coordinator, whose phone number is not 911, ask to have an address assigned, request a letter confirming the address is their address, and obtain that letter from a different agency. We think. We called 911 coordinators in North Dakota, and even they weren't sure how this is supposed to work, probably because it's not supposed to. Tribal leaders are doing their best to assign addresses to voters in time, but it is insane that they have to because North Dakota straight up made a law saying people with certain addresses can't vote with no justification. Even when Christopher Columbus screwed over Native Americans, he was at least like, God told me to do it? <laughs> Let's continue our tour of voter suppression with Georgia gubernatorial candidates Stacey Abrams and Brian Kemp. Stacey and Brian are polling neck and neck, well within the margin of, oh, God, oh my God, no, a runoff election? I really can't handle four more weeks of this. But Brian Kemp just got a potential boost from a very powerful ally, Georgia's Republican Secretary of State. Oh my God. It looks just like you, Brian Kemp. Oh, it is you. Oh, yeah. File that under, how the fuck is that legal? <laughs> Brian Kemp is a secretary of state overseeing his own gubernatorial election. He's like a dog carrying his own leash. If the dog was secretary of state in Georgia. But I'm sure he's avoiding even the appearance of impropriety. Allegations of voter suppression in the Georgia governor's race. An Associated Press report revealed Georgia put a hold on more than 53,000 voter registration applications with nearly 70% of them belonging to African Americans. 70%? That's in a state that's only 30% black, by the way. So if I do the math in my head, let me see, that's fucking racist. <laughs> the applications in question were put on hold for failing to meet controversial exact match criteria, which allows the state to void registrations that are a single letter or even a hyphen off from the voter's ID, as seen here in spider hyphen man's rejected form. And while you'd think that punctuation is colorblind, well. The reality is that minority voters are often the ones with unusual names that are sometimes harder for state officials to capture accurately in the state's database, and they are being penalized for that. Right, because white people have normal names like Quinn and Brakota. The two candidates in the race have vastly different views on whether stopping people from registering to vote makes it hard to vote. The miasma of fear that is created through voter suppression is as much about terrifying people about trying to vote as it is about actually blocking their ability to do so. Those folks that are on the pending list, all they have to do is go to the polls, show their photo ID, and they can vote. Why wouldn't you trust this Civil War statue who wished to be a real boy? <laughs> All they have to do is show their photo ID and convince an ancient poll worker that it's okay for them to vote even though their name isn't on the list. I mean, does Kemp really expect us to believe that'll work? My Nana gets flustered at the coin star machine. She thinks it's for sorting buttons. <laughs> Republicans are getting more creative and more shameless about their attempts to block the vote because they know they're not popular enough to win without cheating. They truly are the Blake Shelton of political parties. I mean, he's not even the sexiest man on The Voice. Don't at me, Shelties. Voting shouldn't be a privilege, but as long as it is, if you can, you better fucking use it and help other less privileged people do it too. I mean, even Carson Daly's better. In today's super reasonable political climate, you'd be forgiven for thinking the only way to effect change would be to re-traumatize yourself in an elevator. But the midterms are coming, which means you get to vote and be totally fucked by a map.
State houses have been redrawing districts to their advantage for years, artificially helping to keep their party in power. Gerrymandering. 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 <laughs> yes, gerrymandering. It results in districts that look like this, this, and this one that's giving the finger to black people in Detroit. When you look at gerrymandering maps with their like odd little borders, it's hard not to like think back at the redlining maps that divided people by um, race. They are diluting the power of the votes of the citizens. Is gerrymandering a type of retrospective segregation? I think it is. I think it is segregation upon segregation. Or as Jeff Sessions calls it, the perfect country club. Since the GOP took over the House and Senate in 2010, they've red wedding the voting map, crafting one insanely shaped district after another, allowing politicians to take your vote as seriously as a woman with a credible sexual assault charge. Ugh, that shit still makes me so angry! Gerrymandering is bad, but it's not like it's life or death. Gerrymandering in Michigan connects to the Flint water crisis because... Oh, for fuck's sake! because the Republican leaders simply don't see any reason <laughs> to be responsive to the community where they've shuffled all the other party's voters. Which only matters if you're someone who drinks water. Flint's tap water was laced with dangerous levels of lead. The state knew about it and did nothing. 1,600 days since we've had access to clean, suitable drinking water. I think one of the things that's most haunting about what happened in Flint is that everyone knows that what happened there would not have happened in a community like Ann Arbor or Grand Rapids that is both wealthier and whiter. I mean, Ann Arbor sounds just like an actual white woman. I think I know her, <laughs> and I think I know how she votes. In the 2014 state senate election, only 50.4% of Michigan voted Republican, yet the GOP got 71.1% of the seats. And that's weird because 50 and 70 are different numbers. Can someone save Michigan? I love black people! No, no, someone else. Enter Katie Fahey, who founded Voters Not Politicians, an anti-gerrymandering organization in Michigan. As impressive millennials, we began with the traditional avocado toast and crystal exchange. Knowing that we actually had a form of direct democracy here in Michigan, the ballot initiative process, I was like, why don't we use this thing? So I quit my job to try and amend the state constitution and end gerrymandering full time. Oh my God, yeah. I totally know what it's like to make a difference because I talk on TV sometimes. Her group gathered over 400,000 signatures for their ballot initiative, Proposition 2. Proposition 2 will make it so that voters will draw these district lines and not politicians. We'll have four Democrats, four Republicans, and then five independent or third party voters. And now she's spreading the word about Prop 2 using her youthful energy and government's trying to restrict your districts, misrepresenting your interests for interest. Just by smiling, me. It'll be over soon. The biggest thing we're doing is making gerrymandering illegal. What do you think Michigan would look like without gerrymandering? I think it would look like what we were hoping America could be, where your vote should actually matter and your politician should listen to you and just want to kind of kick it old school. Oh no, don't do it. Sign this petition and I'll stop being repetitive. Yeah, okay, maybe it's because I'm even whiter than Katie, but this is right. actually growing on me. And so are these people who are more than happy to take up the cause in the nerdiest ways possible. Huh, I never thought I'd say that I miss white rapping. Can Michigan slay the gerrymander? They need to vote. You hear that, Michigan? Flip over your ballot, look down at the bottom and vote yes on two. Yes, Unless you like poison water, two. your choice. Yes, and we all need to flip over our ballots. We might just end up voting to unfuck ourselves. Guys, we're 55 days from the midterm elections and one phrase is on every pundit's lips. Blue wave, blue wave. We have a blue wave coming in the House. Democrats will take over the House in November. I actually t think that Democrats have a real chance of taking back the Senate. The House and the Senate? Lady, there's no guarantee the Democrats could successfully take back a shopping cart. <laughs> blue wave 
or no blue wave, American voters mostly agree with Democrats. 97% of Americans want some form of gun control. 62% of Americans want the government to protect the environment better. 75% of Americans say immigration is a good thing. And 100% of Americans believe that hot dogs belong in the crusts of pizzas. And if the Italians don't like it, they can suck it. And yet, the Republicans control the House, the Senate, and the White House, not to mention both chambers and the governor's office in 26 states, plus up to 25% of the Baldwin brothers. We are talking about a lot of power here. That is no coincidence. Republicans have put a lot of strategies in place to stay in power, even when they're in the minority, like voter suppression, such as this recent very brazen attempt in Georgia. Election officials in Georgia County will vote this morning on a controversial proposal to close seven of its nine voting places. Many community members say that would hurt African-American voters. They tried to close down seven of nine polling places? The only reason they didn't close down the other two is because they were located inside a Jimmy Buffett concert where black people could never find them. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why they wanted to close polling places in a predominantly black county. Couldn't beat a prevent the election of America's first black woman governor, could it? A now fired consultant had recommended the closures because he said the precincts were not in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. You know what else is gonna make it hard for disabled people to vote? Not having a polling place. <laughs> Don't blame disabled people for your racism. That is mean in about six different ways. The most shocking thing about this was that for once it didn't work. The county election board voted down the proposal and the polling places will remain open. But in a lot of places, it's left to the courts to decide. And the GOP has been hard at work taking over those two. I'm sure you remember how they successfully bench blocked judicial gnome Merrick Garland and placed Buffy villain Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court. <laughs> But what you may not know is that they've been doing that at every level of the judicial system. Republicans in the Senate blocked so many of Obama's judicial nominees that they created 107 big juicy holes for Donald Trump to fill. The nausea you're experiencing from hearing me say big juicy holes for Donald Trump to fill <laughs> is exactly how you should feel because stacking the courts with conservatives is deeply ominous for voting rights. As just one example, the Supreme Court recently ruled five to four, including Gorsuch, that Ohio could purge its voting rolls of inactive voters. That means every other state can too. We are gonna purge today. Not that kind of purge, Florida. Don't get excited. <laughs> but the piece de resistance and the main reason why Republicans don't need anyone to agree with them to win elections is gerrymandering. In 2010, Republicans took advantage of the census year to go all in on gerrymandering, drawing districts so skewed that North Carolina looked like the aneurysm I have every time I think about the year 2010. <laughs> As David Daly lays out in his book, Rat Fucked, the Republicans' plan was the brainchild of Republican operative Chris Jankowski. If you, if you haven't heard of him, he's basically Karl Rove without all that smoldering sex appeal. <laughs> Jankowski created a project called Red Map, and buckle up, because it is as terrifying as it is boring. What is Red Map? Red Map is a strategic plan to pool money on the national level and invest it into the key state legislative races where there was gonna be a redrawing of congressional lines based on the census data, and focusing on the states that were either gonna lose a congressional seat or gain a congressional seat to have maximum impact. Oh, 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 God, I had a terrible dream that a talking sports jacket broke democracy. Oh, my God, it was real. In order to redraw redistricting maps in their favor, Republicans targeted a few key state legislature seats that had never really faced large amounts of campaign cash before, poured a ton of money into them, and buried Democratic incumbents using negative ads like this one, which some say portrayed State Senator Margaret Dixon as a prostitute. Margaret Dixon, not once, not twice, but three times busted special deals, insider trading, no bid state contracts, all for her own gain. What does Margaret Dixon really care about? To be fair, that ad is not showing her as a prostitute. She's clearly leaving the money. That makes her the John. <laughs> and it worked. 
Republicans won all the races they needed to control key states' redistricting, which led to the most gerrymandered districts in history. Republicans crammed as many Democrats as possible into as few districts as possible, locking in GOP majorities for close to a decade. Bottom line, Republican votes actually count more, and they lost whatever incentive they had to work with the other side. But don't worry, Chris doesn't like feel bad or anything. Do you have any regrets for something that you helped to create? No, I just don't. Trump is president, Nazis are back, que sera, sera. <laughs> Because of all their judicial theft, gerrymandering, and vote suppressing, Republicans have made seemingly competitive races almost impossible to win. In 2012, Democrats got over a million more votes, but Republicans won a 33-seat advantage in the House, and the situation is still dire. In fact, the districts are so skewed that according to the Brennan Center, in order to take back the House, Democrats would need to turn out 15 million more voters than they did at the last midterms. 15 million! Where are they going to find those kinds of numbers? Oh, hang on a sec. According to USA Today, 15 million people played Pokemon Go in 2016. <gasps> I know what Democrats have to do! Pokemon go to the polls. <laughs> My God! That try-hard robot was right all along.